Um, all right. Let's see. Oh, where am I? I apologize. Um, all right. So it is 632. And I will call this meeting to order. This is the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. It is Wednesday, July 10th, and it is 6.32. Um, I don't have the thing that I'm supposed to read, but basically the thing that I'm supposed to read is about the acts, the special acts of 2021, allowing us to conduct this meeting remotely. There is no in-person attendance as we are all remote. Um, I don't remember what else I'm supposed to say, but that's basically the gist of it. Um, so I'll go over the agenda. Um, so we're going to move things around a little bit from what's posted. Um, Chief Ting has joined us and we will have him here for about the first hour of the meeting. Um, so first we'd like to hear from him. Well, well, let's see, welcome. We did that announcements, agenda review. That's what we're doing now. Okay, so then Chief Ting, then we'll have public comment um, and, in, and then updates from the Crest Department, DEI Department, updates about Resident Oversight Board, Youth Empowerment, then we will plan for the fall listening sessions and any other topics we didn't reasonably anticipate. And then a second public comment period and adjourn. Um, so that is the agenda. Here's Deborah. Um, just want to make sure. Deborah, can you hear us all right? Yeah. Okay, we can hear you. And Lisette, um, can you just say hello just to make sure we can hear you? Yes. Hi. Perfect. Wonderful. All right. So everybody can hear and be heard. We're all here. Um, Deborah, I was just saying Chief Ting can only be here until about 730. So we'll have brief announcements, have him go, then have public comments so the public can kind of hear what he's had to say and have a chance to respond to that the rest of the meeting and then additional public comment at the end. Well, can we also do um, member reports though before public comment? Yeah, yep. because I want to make sure to, to do updates and things like that. Yes. All right. Um, so any announcements? Okay. Um, Deborah, do you want to give your member report? Oh, do you want me to do it now? Yeah, we can do it now. And then oh, we'll okay. Awesome. Chief Ting. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, hi, Chief Ting. Um, yeah, I just want to give an update from the last meeting. Um, I think uh, you all remember that at the last meeting, I had um, talked about the fact that I wasn't being reappointed to the CSSJC um, and that I was only on the CSSJC for one um, term. Uh, and so um, kind of, you know, put out the information out there that I wasn't being reappointed. And then the community, um, there was a lot of public comment about it in terms of supporting me. And then obviously I contacted other uh, folks in the community, uh, also had two articles in regards to it, right? Questioning why it is that I wasn't being reappointed to the CSSJC, given my track record, the fact that, you know, I've dedicated my life to social justice, uh, equity, inclusion, and um, anti-racism. So it was really kind of baffling to me as to why I wasn't being reappointed by the town manager. Um, and so there was an article in the Emerson Indy and then one in the Gazette um, doing the questions. And then I think there was the others in the Emerson Indy too, just kind of asking questions around, you know, town committee and how town committee uh, members are appointed and what's the rules and regs in regards to it. I also did a public records request which I shared with a lot of um, community members and the media. Um, and, you know, I want to kind of thank everyone who um, supported uh, me in terms of this. Um, and there were countless people that called the town manager, met with him, sent him emails, um, you know, all sorts of different things, which I really, really appreciate. And I'm happy to report that um, the town manager did call me um, and stated that he is going to be making a recommendation to the town council to reappoint me for another term. And I'll be reappointed for three more years. So I'm really excited about that. 
um, and I'll continue to do this work for, you know, a few more years. I want to obviously thank the CSSJC. You all were really wonderful. And I'm really happy that obviously this group is very supportive um, and that, you know, we see how critical this um, this the work that we're doing, you know, why, why we do the work, right? Um, and again, you know, I want to give a heartfelt thank you to the community um, who, like I said, countless people, and I'm not going to name people just because, you know, obviously then I'll forget someone and then someone will get upset. So I'm not going to do that. Um, but I do want to say the power of the collective voice, right? The power of the community, the power of when it is that the community comes out and feels that you know, something is important and comes together and communicates that. And I really want to thank Paul Bachman publicly for listening to the community. And that's one of the things that he said when he uh, reconsidered was that he he said that the community had communicated with him and were telling him that he had made a mistake. And that and he said that he listened to the community. So I want to thank him publicly for listening to the community uh, because it's important that these voices are heard. And that's why I'm on this committee, right, is to to be the voice um, for those that that a lot of times can't speak in these spheres uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, and I wanna continue to be that voice for as long as, as I can be, right? Um, so I'm really excited to kind of, you know, be here. And I wanna just kind of say one thing as a reminder, right? Um, Cause I wrote it down as to why it is that we do that work, which is to affirm the town of Amherst commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity for black residents, which was that, that commitment that the town made, right? was adopted by the town council in December of 2020. So this is why we do the work that we do, right? It's because the town made a commitment and put out those words that I do not take lightly and the community does not take lightly. And I know that we don't take lightly on this group, right? So I wanna thank you all. And of course, I'm really excited about continuing to be part of this group. Thank you, Deborah. That is excellent news to hear tonight. Um, Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Are all. there any other updates before we move into our discussion with Chief Ting? No? Okay. So I think we wanted to invite you here um, so that we as the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee can kind of hear about what your vision is um, for the Amherst Police Department under new leadership and kind of think about how to forge a path forward working towards some of the goals that the CSWG had laid out um, in terms of both the police department and the alternative to police to see kind of how how Amherst Police Department can support the work of Cress and how you and um, Ms. Theriak can work together. So that was kind of our intention in mm -hmm. inviting you here. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak a little bit and then we can sure some questions. Sure. Can I can I say something before he starts? Yes, please, Everald. Um, so Chief Ting, thank you for coming. Welcome and. Congratulations on your appointment. I don't think I saw you since um, you were made chief. And it, it is a great accomplishment. You've been with the police department for 27 years. So appreciate it. Um, I know you and your family are very excited. Um, something that you've worked for your whole life and that should be um, acknowledged. So congrats on that. Um, and as much as not everyone was happy with your appointment, and again, one of the reasons we wanted to have you here is for you to um, talk to some of the people that may not be um, excited about you being chief, where there is some concerns that the policies are just going to be continued from the previous administrations, so to speak. And mm -hmm. but you know, I, I met with you, I interviewed you, and I know that you very clearly pointed out that you know you had a boss, and so now that you're the boss, I think it's a perfect opportunity for you to align a vision that, um, to Deborah's earlier point, um, racial harmony in with the town, and I think the police department is a big part of that. So again, um, congratulations, it's a great achievement, and welcome, and 
um, talk to the public, um, talk to the people that sometimes often feel overlooked by the police or not treated properly by the police. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody for uh, inviting me into your meeting uh, to meet everybody and to give me an opportunity to kind of speak to you folks and, and everybody else in the community to kind of talk about what the Amherst Police Department uh, is all about and really what my vision for the police department is. And um, certainly the committee had posed certain questions that they wanted uh, specific answers to. And the first one was uh, working with the CSSJC and the HRC and other social justice focus groups and committees in Amherst to make Amherst a more inclusive, safe and equitable place to live and thrive. So it troubles me tremendously when I hear that members of our community are not comfortable in, in our town. Amherst has always been a very inclusive area for everyone. And this is the aim that we have at the Amherst Police Department. We wanna be seen as an agency that works for everyone without bias. You know, with that being said, you know, we feel like we, as, as an agency and as a 46 member department, we are part of this community. Uh, we don't wanna be an outside entity. We don't wanna be an entity that's just viewed as authoritarian. Um, to be honest with you, in our interview process, I think I mentioned to you that I don't even really like the, the, the terminology of law enforcement, because really, that's just a fraction of what we do. And law enforcement within itself is something that is a means to solve a problem. But that's not really what our police department is about. Our police department is about community caretaking. It's about being a part of the community and trying to find solutions to problems. Um, and unfortunately, you know, certainly there's a lot of perceptions out there and there's a lot of um, things that happen on the national and state level that sometimes permeate into the local level and it gets a little bit cloudy. And certainly we want to be as transparent as possible and to be able to work with every group within town to try and eliminate some of those problems. And I think we have a unique opportunity right now certainly because we have a lot of a lot of new leadership in town. Certainly we have Camille from the Crest Department and I'm so glad that she's here. Uh, we've already developed a really strong relationship and a very close collaboration uh, to support each other because I think Crest is important in the town of Amherst. Soon enough, we're gonna have a new fire chief. Um, there's also a new finance director, a new communications director. There's just, this is an opportunity for all of us to kind of harness at this point in time to try and make things better for our town. So and, if and I, I may... Go ahead, Avril, and then I'll, I'll jump in after you. Okay, so if I may pose a question, um, one of the things that I learned during this process was that um, the police department is a sector policing model and can you talk about that and help people understand what that means and why that is? I sure can. So sector-based policing, we the foundation of our police department really is, is community policing and problem-oriented, um, really problem-solving. Um, so the way that we structure our police department, so community policing really is, what that means is, is being really proactive not only to solve crimes, but also to try and prevent crimes. You know, that's the essence of community policing. When I say community policing, that involves everybody. You know, when there's a crime or there's an issue that happens in town, that's not just, it shouldn't just be the, the problem of the police department. That's a community problem. So we try and share and include everybody that might be affected to try and come up with solutions. And that's really what these partnerships are all about. Something that I feel that that has been lacking with APD is having those deeper connections. And I've learned over the years that those connections aren't gonna come to us. And that's something that we have to reach out and foster. Um, those lines of communications is hopefully gonna develop more information, more strategies to try and figure out where we need to be in this town. Uh, so community policing really is about proactivity and prevention of crime before it really happens. So the reason why we have sector-based policing is because in the past, uh, the town is broken up into three sectors, north, center, and south. In the past, you know, when we made assignments for our officers, it would just be different every day, and it was just random. 
And that didn't really make sense to us because if you are a community member and you need to report a crime or an issue to a particular officer, the old system, you would speak to a different officer every single day. So there was zero consistency. What we wanted was some more consistency where our officers are married to a specific sector. So then the people that live in that area know that they can go to Officer Smith and speak to that person. And tomorrow, Officer Smith will be there again. So that familiarity and that consistency is what we were looking for. And that's what we mean by sector-based policing. Hopefully that answers your question. But what, what do you say to people, though, that think that, and, and, and while I understand your rationale, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the town has evolved, the town has changed, the population has changed. And what do you say to people that may feel that neighborhoods that have more minorities are being more policed than other neighborhoods? Yeah, that's an unfortunate perception. I mean, and I've heard that before. And I've taken a good look at our data. Uh, to try and see, is that the case? Um, you know, from my experience, you know, a lot of our BIPOC community live in apartment complexes within town. Um, our neighborhoods are pretty spread out otherwise. And a lot of our calls for service are concentrated within the apartment complexes. So you'll see a lot of activity there because we're getting called upon there. Um, and in many instances, if you were, if we were to try and break down those stats, you'll see that a lot of those calls are from repeated, repeated apartment complexes. So it isn't the whole complex itself, but it might be from specific areas. So what I mean by community policing and community involvement, we've seen that from many other complexes uh, that we've collaborated with that have made a lot of changes. For example, um, when I was a young patrolman to a sergeant, we uh, spent a lot of time at Mill Valley Apartments. We spent a lot of time at Gatehouse Apartments. Um, we spent a lot of time at South Point, which has now changed. And the management did a really good job in trying to figure out, hey, what, what are the solutions to try and make these apartment complexes a little bit better? Uh, so they employed a lot of different resources. They spent money on cameras, camera systems, they hired security guards, uh, better screening of tenants uh, coming in. And now Mill Valley, as an example, we hardly ever go there at all. You know, rarely do we go there for any calls. So there isn't a need to patrol there as much. So when we do patrol a specific area, it's for a reason, because we know that a particular apartment has specific problems, or there, there might have been a break in there or something along those lines. So we're going to give a little more attention to that specific area. And then unfortunately, the perception is, is that we're targeting BIPOC members. In reality, that's just not the case. So I'll ask one more question before I let you go, Deborah. So what can the police do and, and what plans do you have to change that perception? So I, I do recognize that that's a, a negative perception for us. And I do want to try and eliminate that. You know, in the future, what I tried to plan on doing, we're, we're replenishing our troops. We're, we're down a significant number of officers, so we're trying to replenish that. It takes time through the recruitment process and as well as the training process to get them up to speed. So what my vision is, is I would like to have more liaison officers to be able to coordinate with our sector officers and specific apartment complexes. That way we have a direct conduit with management and hopefully we can develop communication and more um, friends with the residents. Therefore, we are gonna learn a little bit more about what's going on within the apartment complexes instead of waiting for a call. And that way that one designated officer can try and mitigate some of those problems instead of having more patrols in that particular area. So that's something that I'm really gonna focus on. Uh, we do have a neighborhood liaison officer that officer, Bill Laramie, is specific to town gown issues with the university. And he has made tremendous strides in terms of our relationship with the college population and our relationship with the university to try and mitigate uh, quality of life issues. So we've seen the power of outreach and having those type of collaborative relationships. And I think we can use that model to try and mirror it with complexes and neighborhoods 
within our town instead of just concentrating on college kids. I, I know I said one last question. Um, yeah. I promise this is the last one. Sure. How does so? How does Cress fit into um, this model of yours to change perception? Because one of the big things about Cress is meant to be an alternative to certain police functions, not to replace, but there's some things that Cress can do. So given that you understand this perception and we now have this um, department that is meant to do alternative policing, how does Cress fit into um, that process that you just talked about? They absolutely fit into that process. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. In, in, in this particular family in town, um, there was a family in town and, and some folks on this panel are probably familiar with this particular story. Um, this particular person in town was very prominent, um, worked in our school systems. And, um, and unfortunately he's, he, he was, he was ill and his family members had a hard time caring for him. And so they had reached out to look for assistance, assistance in helping for care for this individual and even getting rides and medications and press came along. This is something that we don't have the, the resources, the manpower to divert that kind of attention. Press came in and assisted that family tremendously mm -hmm. to give them that support. You know, even if it was a ride to the doctor's office or to make sure their medications were right, you know, so that's something that, that they were able to do. And that's just a snippet of what they do um, to try and incorporate that customer service that's desperately needed in the town. Um, and that's something that unfortunately we not, we don't necessarily have the resources for and Crest does. Uh, so they can be incorporated in many other ways. And certainly when we discover what issues there are within these apartment complexes, it doesn't necessarily need to have a police officer deal with it. You know, it could certainly be a Crest member to come in and help mitigate whatever problem it is. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Deborah. You're... No, no worries. That's why we're here. That's his questions. So, um, hi, Chief. I want to, you know, obviously welcome you um, and thank you for uh, meeting with us. I was thank glad you. to hear that you were willing to, to meet with CSSJC. And I'm hoping that this will be a continual relationship and a, a continual conversation sure. um, because, unfortunately, I know, as, as you said, that, that there's this perception, but unfortunately, because I was on the Community Safety and Working Group, and mm -hmm. remember, we did work with the Seventh Generation Collective, who ended up doing a variety of different, um, you know, focus groups and also gathering a, a data, right, from people who uh, reported around the APD. And mm -hmm. of course, we're talking 2020, 2021, right? However, we're also talking since then, so community members come and, and talk to me, but that data really focused on, on saying a lot around what the fear and the intimidation mm. and a, a lot of retaliation that they felt um, from the APD and a mm. lot of times focused on young people, right? And young people who are BIPOC people and, mm -hmm. and, and really kind of, you know, whenever there were incidents in town, whenever any type of suspicion would occur, the, the BIPOC youth would be the ones that would first be um, questioned by the police as opposed to uh, other youth that would be there. Whenever there's stops in town, and we 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 held town forums, you know, in CSWG and also in CSSJC, and we heard stories over and over again when there would be stops. Uh, and if it was a, a, a Black um, um, driver, how they would be um, you know, kind of dealt with by the police. And then if it was a white driver, what would happen, right? Or even sometimes when it was a white driver, but there was black kids in the car, it would be the black kids who would get kind of, you know, um, dealt with negatively as opposed to the actual driver of the a car who was, a, you know, the white driver. So, sure. you know, we heard, you know, countless stories over and over again. And so for us, it's important for us to have this continual conversation, right? Because sure. I heard you, I was there at your um, talk when you, you know, were an an answering questions and you said that you were going to be a different chief. And I'm, I'm going to hold you to that, right? Mm -hmm. That this is a new day. This is going to be a new APD. And obviously, I am all about that. I'm all about. And so I want to, I want us, I want CSSJC and the APD to have this type of frank, honest 
discussion and be able to have these types of conversations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, for it to be a continual conversation. So for me, I guess like some of the questions that I have is one, one would be to kind of like kind of talk a little bit around your response for the sector-based policing. Because like I said, seventh generation collective did do some work for us and really looked at a lot of the data. Again, 2019, you know, 2018, 2020, some of the data did, did not equate what you are saying right now. So it wasn't just impressions, it was actually the data basically confirmed that based on your sector-based policing, you were over-policing. APD was, not you personally. I'm saying APD, no, yep. over-policing, the data actually showcased. So if you go to the seventh generation collective report, they broke it down where they actually showed that a lot of the sector-based policing was really more so over-policing of those communities where it was low income and more BIPOC people that lived in the, the apartment complexes. And what I mean about that is that there was police there when there wasn't any calls, right? So the calls were few and far between. Really, they were there because they were monitoring and policing, and then they were intervening. Right. And then when you compared it to other communities that were like in Amos Woods and other more affluent communities, the data was a very different and told a very different story. So I, I don't know if things have changed. I would be happy if they have. And so one of my questions would be um, not not questions, but my, I guess one of my requests would be if you would be willing to share some data to actually showcase that that's no longer what's happening. Because like I said, if you go to the seventh generation collective report, that is what was happening, you know? And, and that's why we made a lot of the recommendations we made, right? In the CSWG, mm -hmm. in terms of Crest and other recommendations that we made, because oh, we were very oh. concerned and very disturbed by the sector-based policing that was called community policing, but really was over-policing and not this kind of community policing um, kind of, um, description that you shared with us here today. I hope that that's where things are, you know, and that actually the police are building relations in the community, but in a way that's more kind of like interactive as opposed to, you know, monitoring and being there to, you know, kind of the gotcha and catcher type of situation, especially in terms of these neighborhoods that are, are you know, BIPOC heavy and low income heavy. So I wanted to ask you that question. And then I have two more also after that, if you could kind of talk a little bit about that. Sure. So you used uh, Amherst Woods as an example, right? And and you're correct. We don't police there that often because, again, we don't get called for, for services there. So it's, again, we're problem oriented. So if there's no problems there, then we're not really going to spend a lot of time there. You know, we only have three patrolmen on on each shift. So each call that comes in that has any severity requires two officers. So we get used up really quickly. So for us to to sit there in areas that don't really have any problems, we're not going to spend a lot of time there. However, recently, you know, we did get a, um, we, uh, there's a, a neighborhood that in within Amherst Woods, and basically they signed a petition for a particular stop sign and speeding enforcement. Traffic uh, enforcement is one of the probably the biggest complaint that we get across town, across every neighborhood. And so we did spend a lot of time in Amherst Woods. We conducted a traffic study. And when the when the officers had off time, they analyzed how many stops that they had. They tried to figure out, you know, where the violators were coming from. Is it people cutting through? Is it people from their own neighborhood? So we can try and figure out, you know, who's committing the these traffic offenses. So you'll see a lot more calls within the past year as and Amherst Woods because there was a specific problem there. And so again, you know, unfortunately, um, I haven't seen that study that you're talking about. So I, I really can't speak in terms of what statistics were presented there. Uh, I'll be happy to take a look at that at some point, but I have no idea what that contains. So I, I can't really speak upon that. So to further, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, our interaction with the youth. And, you know, I don't know if if you're aware, I'm sure you are, you're from this town, 
Mm -hmm. One of the biggest challenges that we've had is breaking in in terms of having collaborations with the school, you know, and that's very important to me. I've spoken about that in the past because I grew up in this town. I'm a member of the BIPOC community. That was me when I was growing up. And I had my own personal interactions with APD officers as well. Um, so I have that perspective from both views. So from a police department standpoint, one of the foundations that I want to impress upon is having that solid relationship with the youth, you know, and we're making extremely uh, great strides in terms of building that foundation through a lot, of, a lot of our programs. You know, we have an after school program that we collaborate with, which is called Vela, Steps to Success, Morning Movement, uh, Unity Basketball, the RISE program, we have an adventure academy for kids in town. We have a fishing derby. We uh, utilize our ropes course for different groups. Um, we sponsored a class through ancestral bridges. Um, and we collaborate with, with the university and Merce College to try and have collaboration so we can gain some more perspective with the youth in our town. And I truly believe that if we have a good relationship with the youth in our town, if we do end up pulling over one of these young ladies or men that we know, it's going to eliminate a lot of those barriers that you're talking about, you know, because we are going to know who these kids are. They're going to know who we are. Um, and that's really what we're trying to build here. So I hear you. And, and I understand that perception. We're trying to erase that. So um, I mean, what I'll do then is I'm, I'm going to forward to you, you know, after the meeting, I'll, maybe not today, but let's say tomorrow, a copy of the seventh generation, um, sure. you know, collective report so that you have that so that you can review that. And then what would be helpful would be, you know, based on the data that they provided us, if mm. you would be willing to provide data in terms of Absolutely. what is occurring now, because according to what you're saying, basically you all are just going in the communities based on, you know, calls. Whereas, like I said, the, 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 the data that we had analyzed previously when I was on CSWG was yeah. that there was a lot of poli uh, 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 policing and monitoring happening without calls without problems actually occurring in those in those communities. And therefore, you know, that's where the problem lies. And that's why a lot of people in those communities were feeling very intimidated and scared and, and, and feeling that they were being monitored. Right. You're probably right. You know, we have these, what we call it is security checks, right? And so, you know, for example, at the beginning, especially on the midnight to eight shift, you know, at the beginning of the shift, we ask our officers, to do a perimeter check of their particular sector. So they can kind of familiarize themselves right off the bat to see what's going on, especially in their business district, especially in concentrated areas. So then therefore, if they roll through there three or four hours later and they can see changes, you know, so that, that is part of sector-based policing. We do call that security checks. The measure is meant for goodwill. And unfortunately, you know, it's perceived as, as negative. And so that's something we can certainly examine and take a look at. So I hear what you're saying. Yeah, and then I'm I'm glad to hear that you all are, um, you know, interacting more with the youth in terms of getting to know them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, hopefully it is in terms of getting to know them in ways, especially our BIPOC youth, in ways that is not, you know, kind of threatening and intimidating Absolutely. because because of things that we keep on hearing so that there will be, you know, different relations with the APD, because, you know, a lot of times when it is a white youth, it's kind of like a pat on the hand. Okay. Well, you know, it, it's okay. Which is really what you're supposed to do, right? With young people, sure. young people are going through development. They make mistakes. That's what happens. So I'm glad that you all are dealing with young white youth as youth, right? And saying, Hey, you made a mistake. So I'm not going to, you know, bring you in. I'm not going to do this and that. But the thing is, is that we want that too for our BIPOC youth, right? The same relationship that you all are having with the white youth, we want it with the BIPOC youth. We want it with the youth that English is not their first language. We want it with the youth that it is low income and so on and so forth and struggling, right? The youth that are marginalized, that are not, you know, part of the, you know, mainstream town. We want those types of relationships, you know, with the youth, youth that are having mental health issues, so on and so forth. It are the ones that we want you all to know, hey, Crest needs to be called for those, you know what I'm saying? As opposed to, you know, the police, you know, engaging in, in those types of situations, which makes me kind of oh, segue to that a little bit. 
Um, you know, with Cress, I, I do know that you said that, you know, Cress is being called in and I'm happy to hear that you and Camille are, are having a great, you know, kind of working relationship and figuring things out. But I wanted to ask you, you know, one of the things that has been really difficult has been around the dispatch, right? Which I know the dispatch is under your purview. So I wanted to kind of get a sense from you, where are things at to make sure that, you know, the, the correct calls are being dispatched um, to Cress and then other calls to APD. And for me, um, I, like I said, I was on the original group CSW, CSWG mm. where we make the recommendations. Basically, we said anything that did not involve violence or, or a serious criminal behavior, and that's right in the report, mm. should be uh, going to Cress. So I, I wanted to see what your um, kind of take is on, on where things are at with that. So there's there's a lot of variables that come into play. Uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, unfortunately, when a call comes in, it's never what it, it necessarily is. Uh, a caller may call something in, and unfortunately, the only constant in policing is is the the unknown. Um, so when a caller calls in, we never we're never quite sure exactly what it is. Sometimes it is what it is, and sometimes it isn't. Uh, so we have to prepare for all contingencies. So when I say variables, there were a lot of variables, a lot of hurdles that that press and the police department had to kind of jump through to get to where we are today. You know, first, first, for example, um, you know, it's a change in working conditions when you have a separate agency. And when that separate agency comes in and the work that they do is is a difference from the work that you used to do. So certainly the unions get involved. Um, so there were the patrolman's union, there was the SEIU union, there was the supervisor's union for the police department. And that was a hurdle that we needed to, to get across. And we were, we were able to make strides with those uh, unions to make sure that we have a strong relationship with CRESS. So now that that piece is done, um, the next piece is policies and procedures. We have to operate under with policies and procedures simply because with every call that goes through, there's really two prongs that we need to satisfy. And those two prongs are safety and liability. So safety is paramount and that's the first step. So with any call that comes through, we have to determine, is there a safety aspect? So you were saying, you know, nonviolent calls. That's the thing is we don't necessarily know if it's nonviolent. You know, we need to be able to vet out that safety aspect. Once that aspect is done, now we focus on the liability aspect. The liability aspect is making sure that whatever the problem is, is at the very least solved at that moment. You know, and it may not necessarily be solved at that moment. We may have to incorporate a different agency or other resources to try and figure out that problem. Unfortunately, the police department, you know, and I hate to phrase it in this way, but with most situations, we are just a temporary solution. You know, we are not a, a fix all type of uh, entity. You know, our job is to make sure that we can pass this problem on to somewhere else that has the resources. You know, if it's a mental health issue, perhaps the hospitals are need to get involved. You know, if it's another issue that the courts might be able to get involved. You know, and certainly this is where CRESS plays a role, you know, because they have resources that we don't necessarily have. Yeah, and I get that. I mean, I, I understand, obviously, you know, I can't purport to to, to say the, the, you know, the seriousness of the work and the risk mm -hmm. that you all, uh, are involved in, right? I, that's mm -hmm. something that is beyond my comprehension a lot of the times. However, you know, and we are being kind of patient in terms of seeing how these things are going to be figured out, right? Because the point of the matter is, is that you know, there's always going to be variables, right? But there's going to be certain sure. calls that is going to say, okay, well, this is what it's, you know, it's a noise complaint or is a, or it's a, you know, kind of like nuisance call or it's a this or it's a that, that there will be certain enough facts to, to be able to say, hey, you know, this is a situation where Crest needs to go, you know, needs to, to be dispatched to, as mm -hmm. opposed to the police. I mean, you know, there could always be an option for the Crest to ask for backup from the police or to ask for assistance or something like that. You know what I'm saying? But my thing is, is that, yeah, it, it's so kind of like- If I can answer that real quickly, Ms. Ferrer, mm -hmm. so, and um, 
you know, you wanted me to be 100% honest with you, and I'm trying mm -hmm. to do that. So, yeah, thank you know, you. another one of the hurdles that we had was that, you know, initially, you know, we were under the, we were under the impression that, you know, that the idea of Crest was to be entirely separated. So we had said from the beginning, from the beginning as a police department, we are willing to support Crest. We're willing for co-response. We want to be involved, but we were, we were consistently told, nope, it needs to be 100% separated, separate dispatch center, separate building, separate vehicles, separate uh, data mining, separate reporting systems, separate everything. So that kind of stonewalled us in terms of, okay, so where do we stand in terms of the conversation of collaboration? Because I'm, I'm here to tell you, we are 100% committed to make sure Crest is successful and that Crest is a part of this community and sustained. Um, and we want to do that. And that's part of our conversations is can we have some type of response where you know, there's a warm handoff. If we decide, hey, you know, this is probably better for Cress, but we eliminate that safety issue and let's let Cress handle it from this point on. Or if Cress can say, hey, wait a second, there's some dangers here and this probably is in our realm, let's make sure the police department handles it. And it, we are willing to have those conversations. And again, that's why I'm glad Camille is here is because with the old administration, we've been waiting for policies and procedures to be developed and they were never fruitful. So now Camille is here and we're almost, we're right there. The, the policies and procedures have been developed. They need to be reviewed and vetted out and make sure that we can come up with solutions to that type of warm handoff that you're talking about. So we are absolutely open to all of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, as you said, right, the, 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 the vision was all, always to have a separate entity you know, to, you know, make sure that there was a separate space. I think the dispatch, though, was something that we knew that most likely was going to be, you know, start out with the police and then, you know, maybe eventually whatever Crest could have its own dispatch. I don't know. But there would always be a phone number for Crest, though, too, right? right? So that people can contact Crest and everything. Um, I don't know if I would go so far as a co-response, you know. I would, like you said, possibly, yeah. like, either Crest would go out or the police will go out of this sure. violence, but then the police would notice that obviously there was it, it's not a violent situation; it's actually a mental health or an unhoused situation, and then Crest would be you know called in and everything, exactly. or vice versa, or vice versa. Exactly. Right? Crest shows exactly. up, and then they need assistance from the police. And yeah, we we always envisioned that type of collaboration. Right. So but the it, thing is, is that yeah, there has to be that good faith, right? So well, there has that's to why be I'm glad we're I'm, that's yeah. why I'm glad we're having this conversation. Because, you know, the, like I said, part of those barriers were, you know, we tried, we tried to tread lightly because we didn't want to offend anybody. We didn't want to, we don't want to come off as if we don't want this to happen. We don't want it to appear that, you know, that we're trying to sabotage because we're not. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were really okay. careful because we don't want to be intrusive for anyone in the, in the public to think, oh, the police is trying to take over. We're not. You know, that's that's the mantra that we had heard. That's that's what we were hearing, that everything needed to be separated. So we we're trying to be careful with that. And relative to the dispatch center, you know, they fall under a different union. Although they fall under our purview, it's still a little bit separated. And I think their biggest concern was, again, the liability aspect. Mm -hmm. Because if they send somebody to a call where there's no specific policies and procedures that outlines it, and something goes wrong and somebody gets hurt, then they're potentially liable because they could have sent the police if it was a dangerous call and they didn't. So those are some of the hurdles that, that behind the scenes we're truly working on to try and make sure that we can get the correct calls out there. Good. And then lastly, because I know I'm sure others have other questions. And so even well, though I, I have a ton of questions, but I'll, I'll limit myself. Um, and I know you have to go soon, but hopefully you'll come back again, you know, to also kind of first continue this Absolutely. conversation. But Absolutely. my my kind of last question, because I'm sure others will ask other questions that I have too, which is, you know, one of the main things when I was doing the work on CSWG and then also now on CSSJC is around making sure that that the police, and that's part of our Part B recommendations for CSWG, which was for the police to be actively anti-racist. 
right? Which is a it, which is a culture that it's not just kind of like saying that it's colorblind or mm -hmm. just acknowledging that there's race, but actually analyzing, you know, seeing where, you know, the culture is racist and where the culture is white supremacist and white privilege and all of those things to actually actively tackle it, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not just training every one, once in a while or the training because I know you all go through a lot of training that the state asks you all to, to train and then includes you know bias training and so on and so forth it's actually a, a way of of being right where you're being cool. actively anti-racist and, cool. and and promoting a, a culture of anti-racism so I wanted to ask you you know where are you at because obviously now you're the the, the new chief you set the goal and you set the standard right in terms of what it is that you want the APD to be about so I wanted to know if that's something that you've already started to promote since you're the new chief absolutely you know I I've always felt felt that we have a pretty strong checks and balances within our police department I've already implemented a new system um, a new reporting system and so basically all of our reports and all of our incident incidents and anything that our police officers encounter, it goes through a series of checks and balances that goes all the way from sergeant to lieutenant to detectives, all the way up to the captains and the chief. Uh, that way everybody gets eyes on it to be able to take a look at the incidents and take a look at what the officers are doing out there to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, and again, it, perception is king, right? You know, for me, you know, again, I, I grew up in this town. I've experienced my share of racism. You know, I didn't grow up with money. You know, I came from very humble, humble beginnings. And as well as my family, we worked our way up to this point. I'm very fortunate to be in this position. To be honest with you, I never thought I'd be in this position. And I'm very, very lucky to be here. And I think I can make a change. Um, and that's why I'm happy that, that I got selected over the other person because I've been invested in this community for longer than just 27 years, my whole life. Um, so with that being said, if there was an inkling of racism, you know, within our department, and again, I'm not trying to discount anybody else's perception and I get it, but if there was any racism in this department, we would not tolerate that. You know, we would get rid of any type of, any officers that was racist, or any type of inkling of racism within our police department. And I know that may sound empty, but truly that's my aim. And I certainly would not put up with it. And I know that the officers here that we currently have would not put up with it either. They actually police themselves very much so. Um, with that being said, you know, when I was talking about my vision of having stronger collaborations with apartment complexes, with neighborhoods where there's more BIPOC communities, Again, we're trying to make friends. The more friends we can make, the more they can understand where we're coming from and we can understand where they're coming from. It's a matter of meshing that together. The more relationships we can build upon, then the stronger it's going to be when an incident happens, there's more understanding. Instead of this us versus them type of mentality, I'm trying to erase that. We are one community, and I want us to be one community, not this fractioned uh, just that's just the police department. They go call to call. We want we're, I want to be a part of this community, and that's what I'm trying to build. Allegra Lissette, I don't know if you all have some questions. Lissette, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Hi, Chief Tang. Um, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you. Um, you express yourself very well, so I really appreciate that. Um, but I did kind of have a few comments and questions. Sure. Um, so youth programs, how are these being, sorry, how are these being marketed out into the community? Like flyers, social media, and is it being done in, in various languages? Uh, most of these programs are word of mouth. And most of these programs are centered around the BIPOC community. Um, a lot of them are pilot programs to see if they work and they've been growing. So for example, the Mo morning movement program has become so popular and successful that there's now a waiting list of kids trying to sign on. I don't know if you're familiar with that program. Um, I'm not. 
So what it is, is, is as you may or may not know, the uh, Amherst Middle School and the high school kids, they go to school a little bit later. They start school at 9, 9 a.m. versus other school districts because studies have shown that, that kids of that age need more sleep. And so that gives them that opportunity to go to school a little bit later. So with that extra hours from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning, you know, this program was developed to have some of the some of the marginalized kids who may not have other opportunities to play sports or to do other activities to come in and play basketball and lift weights and collaborate with other school um, officials as well as members from the police department. We incorporate members from the university, especially from their sports teams, as well as Amherst College. And it's developed into a little bit of a mentorship. And what has happened was uh, most recently, we had a meeting with the school committee because we we're trying to further this program and look for some further funding because it's growing so much. And we had testimony from the parents and the kids that were involved in how much this program has changed their lives in many ways. You know, number one, the kids, they look forward to it. So they go to bed earlier. They get their schoolwork done. You know, it's incentive for them. So the parents are thankful. Hey, they're getting on track. And it's because of this program, something they they want to do. It's also eliminating a lot of barriers between the perception of police officers just being out there to get them. And that's just not the truth. So we've developed relationships to the point where when I see them on the street, I know them by name. They know me by name, you know, and I know it works. I know it works because we invited uh, a group of these uh kids to come and work out with our officers in our police department. And the very next day I ran into one of them and they were walking to uh, the dining commons and there was like three of them. So I pulled over, I said hello to them and I offered them a ride. And then I learned that they play lacrosse on, on the uh, high school team. My son plays lacrosse on Belchertown. And then a couple of days later, they played against each other. And we just had this really nice collaboration with all these little connections and it truly works. It truly works. So, you know, these are some of the things that we're doing. We're not marketing it. It's, it's, it's mostly word of mouth and we're looking for uh, kids that really need it. So that's okay. pretty much what we've been doing. Oh, thank you for explaining that. No problem. Um, something I, I actually do not know what an officer liaison is. Mm -hmm. So an officer liaison is, it's just, it's just a, a conduit. So for example, our neighborhood liaison officer, Bill Laramie, so he deals with all town gown issues. What, what does that mean? So that means anytime when there's, um, we have quality of life issues when we're dealing with college students. So he is the point person. That's what I mean by a liaison. We have one particular person for one particular area. So that way there's consistency. So everybody knows if there's a particular problem with, let's say the fraternities, they're gonna go and see Bill Laramie about it. And that's what I mean about having a liaison. Okay. Uh, is there a liaison with like mental health? Uh, well, yes and no. We have, we have a CIT team, which is a, a crisis intervention team. So when we deal with uh, people who have mental health issues, our team will actually follow up on them and after whatever incident happened to check up on them and see if they need additional resources. We also do have uh, clinicians that work in house. They are, they, are paid, they are paid for by CSO, so they're not employed by us, um, but we give them the space in our police station. So they respond with our officers to deal with certain mental health issues. That way it's more out of convenience. So if we need a clinician, instead of calling for one, they're already right there and they can deal with the issue right from the get-go. So we do have not a designated liaison, but we do have officers that specialize in that. And certainly there's there's room for Cress to handle a lot of those as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I think a lot of my questions were actually asked by other members of the, um, the board. Mm -hmm. um, but pretty much, you know, as things came up and conversations were held, one mm. of my questions was how is, because it sounds like a lot of the plans that you have for the community 
Mm -hmm. um, are things that I think Crest was in created and intended to do. Mm -hmm. So if you, the Amherst Police Department is planning on doing that, then what would be the point and role of Crest? I, I don't see why we can't both do it. You know, again, we're trying to build relationships and, um, you know, some people feel more comfortable with Crest and some are fine with the police. We want to be mm -hmm. able to give the community that option. Um, and that's kind of how I see it, you know, and, and to be honest with you, we, we kind of fit in different roles, but really dealing with the same type of uh, problems and with the same clientele, certainly. So I don't see why we can't kind of share that together. Right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I had one question, or I think we have time for one question from me. Um, so Deborah had referenced part B of the CSWG reports, and some of that was the LEAP report that had gone over some of the policies and made some policy recommendations to change mm -hmm. or review policies for. So some mm -hmm. of them were like pretext stops, consent searches, yeah. reviewing the use of force policy. And I was just wondering if that's a process that has been started now that you're at the helm. Or Absolutely. Something. So to answer that question, you know, the use of force, we are actually currently rewriting that. It's not so much rewrite. Um, you know, as you as you may or may not know, we're an accredited agency. So it's Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission that gives us that that accreditation status. And what that is is every three years, uh, basically, there's a set of standards that we have to adhere to from the Mass Police Accreditation Committee. And those standards have to we have to show compliance to show that we are doing what we say that we're doing. So every three years, there is a an assessment where they bring in folks from, from their organization and they basically dissect all of our policies and procedures and they take a look at all of our compliance to see if our standards are met with their commission to be able to give us that accreditation status. So they had just, they had just recently come out with a new addition with their standards. And what that new addition is, there's certain language that needs to be added because of police reform. So they want to make sure that in your use of force policy that you have specific language that's included in your policy. And that language is adhered to with Mass Police Accreditation, uh, also with the Mass Police Training Council, and certainly with the legislators. So that is being worked on, but it's just minor tweaks. So in terms of consent searches, so we do have that in our policy, but that's frowned upon. And rarely do we ever use it. We only use it for exigent circumstances. And mostly because, you know, it's still a law in the books, but in our court system, in, in our area, that's certainly frowned upon. And we don't agree with it. You know, we're not out here. We're not, we're not on fishing expeditions to just ask for people for consent when we know that if a police officer is asking you for consent, as a general citizen, you're not sure if you can say no or not. You know, and we understand that, and that's not our aim. So we generally do not do consent searches, but it's still there if there's an exigent circumstance and we need it. Um, but it's rarely used for uh, pretext stops and racial profiling. That is absolutely prohibited, and that's right within our policies and procedure. In fact, we have a bias policing policy and procedure that outlines all of that and it prohibits it. So yes, we have. Uh, we have that in place. Thank you. So it looks like it's 731. I just want to be respectful of your time. Um, and yeah, I, I have a few minutes. Any other questions? I, I don't I, want I to have, leave anyone out. If I can have a follow up to um, actually it's a follow up from Deborah and Allegra's question. So with the, with the use of force policy, what I've seen um, with the, the mass state police, if, if they charge a person um, and the use of force was, and they use force, um, when they turn over paperwork to um, the prosecutors that essentially has to give a copy to the defense attorneys, um, included is a narrative of the use of force that cites the policy. Um, the question is, does Amherst PD have that standing policy that if 
an officer uses force, then they provide that narrative and cite the policy that automatically gives that information to a person's defense attorney so they can review that in protection of um, the person who's charged. And my second question is, mm. one of the things that, um, you know, I, I appreciate that the police department wants to be transparent, um, but one of the things that makes people comfortable with transparency is that there's something they can point to. So what is Amherst's policy about mandating body cams um, with every stop that is done that every officer while on patrol has to wear body cameras and they must be active at all times when they're encountering anyone that they stop or come in contact with? So to try and answer your, I think you have two questions there. So the first question is, do we do we automatically, whenever we criminally charge somebody uh, where there's force use, do we provide our use of force policy? So the answer is no, Yes, that's not within our policy. And the reason why is because that's a public record. So any defense attorney that wants to obtain that, that's very easy to get. Uh, and if they request it, we'll be more than happy to give it to them. It's never requested, you know, because they can find that themselves. We have that online right on our website. So that's easy to obtain. Uh, that's the reason why we don't apply that. Uh, but we certainly could. Uh, that just hasn't really been an issue with the defense attorney. So we haven't visited that. And your second question in relative to body cameras. So we don't have body cameras. So the only cameras that we have is our cruiser cameras. Uh, so on any car stop, that cruiser camera, as soon as the lights turn on, the cameras start to record. And that's by audio and visual. Um, but in terms of body cameras, we don't have any. So, so that doesn't I can really tell you, So I can tell you as a defense attorney that watching body cameras doesn't always does justice as to exactly what's transpiring. And I Agreed. believe I believe in previous chief's exit interview, he advocated for body cameras, and I think he requested money for that to be in the budget. Um, so as the new chief, would you support a budget that meant, you know, that asked for the town to supply body cameras for the department? Mm -hmm. I would if the community supported it. You know, I, I'm I, I all think... for body cameras for transparency, and I agree with you. You know, just a video alone doesn't tell the whole story. Um, there's a lot of factors that come into play to uh, illustrate a particular incident. Uh, however, with that being said, you know, there, there's a lot of factors for um, people who want or don't want body cameras. I fully support it. But if the community doesn't want it, then that's something we, we try to police our community the way that our community wants us to be policed. Right. Uh, so that's the way that I'm kind of looking at it. If the community says, no, we don't want our police to have body cameras then that's something I won't pursue. Um, but if it's something that the, the community says, yeah, you know, we want that transparency, then by all means, we will pursue that. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think the more transparency, the better um, in mm -hmm. terms of, and that will also be able to kind of be more vigilant in terms of what the police are doing. It's not just to have a record to see what they're doing, but also they'll kind of be more preemptive in terms of their behavior and how they're going to interact with someone if they Absolutely. have a body cam on them. You know what I'm saying? So for me, it's just like if there's the funding and if the previous chief, like Avril said, um, had kind of stated that, you know, that would be something that, you know, you all would be supportive of moving forward. Um, I think that would be something that, um, you know, those that get most impacted by the police would actually advocate for. Sure. I think that lends for a further discussion to find out if the community, if that's something that the community either wants or would accept. Um, yeah. Again, we don't want to to implement something that the community doesn't want. Um, yeah. So more discussions on that, certainly, I would think. And then let me just um, say one comment in terms of Lisette's um, um, point that she made at the end, which I thought mm -hmm. was a very good one, which is, and I hear what you're saying in terms of, well, can't Cress and the police do both, you know, do uh, both of them kind of share those types of things. I mean, I still think though, and that's why I was just like, you know, co-response, I'm not really in favor of a co-response between the sure. police and Crest. 
um, I still feel that Cress and the police have very separate lanes. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Sure. Um, but they can do kind of, like I said, the kind of warm handoff and things like that. And so I do think that, you know, as the time continues to go, and that's why even though we wanted things already in place yesterday, just because the recommendations that we made were, were back in 2021 mm. and we're in 2024, right? Um, mm. But we, we do want to make sure that, you know, these types of processes, I'm happy to hear that this process is being put in place, mm. that these processes, you know, happen more quickly than not so that there is that kind of like, okay, Crest is this alternative, right? To policing mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't want you know to have that interaction with an armed police you know what i'm cool. saying because you all do have you know weapons and things like that you all do have arresting powers you all do have those types of other aspects that really intimidate someone and so they'd rather right if, if they're going through some type of cool. crisis you know have that kind of um first interaction with Cress. And I think like even, you know, when we was with CSWG, we met with the police, the then police twice with the with Livingston and the captains. And a lot of them were saying that the police are, are doing a lot of other things that they didn't used to do, let's say 30 years ago or something like that, right? And so you know Cress, that, I yeah. think, yeah. So I think Cress is actually here to, um, you know, supply a service, right? that the police wouldn't have the 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 capacity to do one you know the the, the or the know-how and the knowledge because it's a separate kind of bucket to kind of deal with you know so yeah. um so I wanted to make that same and then lastly what is your kind of um support in terms of the resident oversight board that was also something that we recommended back in 2021 and unfortunately, there's been a lot of delay, delay, delay for the past few years, and that's still not on board. So I just wanted to get, kind of get your take on whether you are supportive of it, because this is something that the community wants. The community has spoken a variety of times on, but yet is still not in place. So just to uh, kind of uh, touch upon some of the things that you said, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of... Um, um, so the resident oversight board that I don't I don't really know where that is you know I think I've told you before that I am in support mm -hmm. of that and I certainly oh. am and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where that is I mean that's not something that that we were coordinating from the police department so it I have no idea where where that stands but you are supportive of it though if it does come about to, to the establishment of a resident oversight board absolutely we need community involvement to be able to have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in all of our activities. And, mm -hmm. you know, I understand your charge, a CSSJC's charge, is to improve the town in mm -hmm. certain terms of, of social justice and in terms mm -hmm. of racial equity. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I would ask for a resident oversight board is for that to be townwide. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there needs to be oversight in every agency, you know, mm -hmm. because there are problems and there's racial equity and systemic racism in every single entity within the town. So I certainly support that oversight. You know, that's something that I welcome. Yeah, and I don't know if you had any thoughts in terms of what I had said um, initially, which was just in terms of like obviously Crest and, and APD having their lanes and things like so, that. So there are models out there from other communities that have what they call as a tiered response. So in dependent on, so for example, instead of having uh, a total separation, which I don't think we really have a total separation because right now we are still collaborating with each other. If you have a tiered response, you know, there's certain policies that would dictate if a call comes out and it has these parameters, right? You may only send a CRESS member or you may only send a police officer or you may send both. And mm -hmm. then when both go there, depending on what develops, then you make that determination of which one breaks off. You know, so there are models that have tiered response and that's something that I think that uh, can be looked at to see if it's an option. And if it if it if it's something that might work, great. If it doesn't work, we go right back to the drawing board. But we will make something work. Mm -hmm. So I'm confident of that. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Maybe we can hear from the public.
Yeah. Well, I don't know if, yeah, Allegra, we can't hear you. I mean, we're going to do a public comment, uh, but I don't know if the chief wants to stay to kind of hear from the public when they do, when we do the public comment, because at this point, that's what we're going to do, open it up. I would love to, but I got to go. Um, <laughs> so this is recorded, am I correct? So yes, recorded. Comment, so you... I, I would love to hear what the public has mm -hmm. to say so I can review that afterwards. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Chief. I really appreciate you coming out. And like I said, um, you know, we'll be inviting you uh, more times to come over and uh, talk with us. I appreciate it. I, I certainly do. And I, I, I enjoy the conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Folks, have a great night. Thank you, Camille. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Um, so we will have open up for public comment. This will be the first of two public comment periods. I don't have the thing I'm supposed to read again, but basically it's that uh, raise your hand with the raise hand function. You'll be brought into the room. Uh, you'll have three minutes to talk and we won't respond. <laughs> I think that's it. All right. So I see one hand up right now. That is Vera. Um, and we have 10 attendees in the audience at this moment. Um, I don't know if I'm a, I don't think I'm a host. So, I think Camille is the host. Yeah, Camille, yeah, do you I'm think trying. you can bring Vera in? Hold on one second. Wait a minute. Uh, oh, I just did something. Gallery. There we go. Okay. Hi, this is Vera. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, Vera Duong Mini Cage. I live at Barnett Farm Apartments in Amherst. Um, I was going to ask Chief Ting if he um, would consider uh, freezing his hires and not uh, elect to ask for in a, a yearly increase as some of our departments um, you know, they're asked to provide a budget every year. Um, and so I just wanted to to see how he would um, respond to that. But um, at the public comment, I um, want to express my relief that um, Deborah, you are going to be continuing your service on this body. Um, I am glad that community members were able to get through to the town manager to change his mind. Um, and I, you know, I think that it illustrates the problem of having one man be in charge and be in control of many people's, you know, destiny, um, destinies. So um, I think that it illustrated by his initial refusal to reconsider, um, it shows how out of touch um, he is with who you are, who the community is, um, and that there's a lot of work to do. And hopefully he understands that there's a need for more voices like yours, Deborah. Um, you have been a very strong and effective voice for the oppressed. And that I hope he understands that there is um, there needs to be room for 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 you and for more individuals who have this type of courage and effectiveness um, and reach and connectedness and love for people. Um, you have love for the community and 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 voices like yours um, need to proliferate in this town. Um, you know people who are uncompromising, people who are not here to collect a paycheck, to get, you know, um, a contract with the town to do, you know, DEI work, um, and then, you know, 
have their voices be diluted in terms of the critique of this town. So I really um, am thankful that the town manager reconsidered, but I hope um, that you know people see the smoke um, and that people try to put out the fire that is burning within our towns. Thank you, communities, thank you. Thank you, Vera, thank you for your support. Good evening. Can people hear me? We can hear you, Ms. Pack. Good evening. Okay, yes, Pat Money Baco, Tamarack Drive. I listened to some of uh, Chip Ting uh, discussion. First of all, I want to thank all of you for your time. And one thing I wanted to voice is about community policing. And I want to repeat what Deborah had said. I was part of the CSWG group member, and we did not recommend community policing. And hearing whatever terminology is being used now, it doesn't really matter. A lot of work has to be done first, a lot of uh, accountability. The police department cannot just force that into marginalized community in which I belong to. It just doesn't work like that. So that has to be, that has to be rethinking of that. It's not something that CSWG supported. I don't support it. We had an incident that happened a couple of years ago, July 5th, no accountability. And all of a sudden, APD wants to start going into our community. No, it doesn't work like that. So that's what I want to say. That's more work to be done for people who look like me to trust the police. And very quickly, um, Deborah, I respect you, admire you. I'm very grateful that you are the voice of so many people, your courage. And for you to be reimported by the town manager, because so many community members rallied behind you, but there's still more work to be done by a town manager. What we're experiencing in Amherst is a, dicta a dicta dictatorship regime where people who speak against our town government get retaliated against, punished, and it must stop. I challenge CSS uh, JC to request, uh, to do a public record request for any resident who have ever applied for any town committee that were rejected because lack of transparency is also dictatorship. That needs to happen. And if the town manager refuses to give it to you guys, a resident can request for that. I can request for that. I can even go through the, through the state. We want everything exposed. I bet you there are some people that I know who have applied for different boards in our town and they were refused because they don't agree with the status quo in our, in our town government. It needs to stop. It's time for the community to push back on Paul Bachman. I also challenge CSSJC to remind you guys that, you know, part of your duty is to ensure social justice in our town, whether it's in business, our town government, our schools, whatever in, in our neighborhoods, and that you guys continue to not to forget um, the upper funds that are still money there, uh, that are organizations that were led by black uh, women, myself included, BIPOC women, who 
criticizes um, our town government. And for that reason, they were being punished for not getting upper funds. So it is your duty as, social, as, as a social justice body in our town to keep asking questions to our town manager, why is it that Black Business Association has not received upper funds? And yet a white influential nightclub, Drake received $300,000. How is there, you know, where is fairness? And we have community connections. Excuse me, we have a three minute limit. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll stop. Give me a Thank you. I mean, no, per the town, we have a three minute limit. Thank you very much. And if you want to, we can have them go beyond that. Camille. No, that's what I, I, I talked to the town and it is also in the town council. They give a three minute limit. So thank you. I'm gonna have to look into that Camille because- That's fine, thank you. That. The meetings keep going on and on, and I appreciate everyone's voice, but I'd like to hear everyone's voice. this is not your voice. meeting, Camille. This is our meeting. Yeah. This is the CSSJC meeting. This is not your meeting. Yes, I'm but sorry I to also, you of that. I know, but this I also was meeting. told it is, as you know, it is three minutes and it has now been almost five minutes. I don't, I don't care about that. I want Ms. Pat to continue to talk. This is not your meeting. I'm, I'm the co-chair of this committee and I want Ms. Pat to continue talking and she's going to continue to talk. I'm sorry. So Ms. Pat, sorry for the interruption. Please continue. The timer already went off, so. So I, I hope you, you do not interrupt again, Camille. Excuse is, me, is, wait a minute. I'm just meeting. letting you know, I'm glad you are the meeting, but I am also here, okay? And it is also my time that is being taken up. And I appreciate because I want to hear everyone's voices, but it is also a meeting where it was supposed to be three minutes and it was given five minutes, okay? And that is a reasonable amount of time for people to get the information that they want out. No, that's what that's what you believe is the reasonable amount of time. But so how women are the co-chairs. But you I'm, have glad, with I'm that, glad no, you no, are. Please, please. Please may I finish? finish? May I finish speaking first? Okay. Oh, you, can, you can go ahead and finish for, speaking first. But you're I'll still talking. Next. Go ahead, Camille. Thank you very much. Okay. So I just want to let you know that we still have a bunch of reports to get out and it is already eight o'clock at night. I have been here since 730 this morning. Okay. And we all have busy lives and it would be great if we could get through this information and move forward. OK, and not talk about the past. The whole idea with Crest is that we are working to get something done in the community. So going backwards and we're talking about and talking about and talking about things that have happened. All right. I am solution focused. And Miss Pat, I understand your frustrations and everything else. But one of the things that would be really wonderful is if we could work together to get things done progressively. I understand. I read the LEAP report. I also read the CS, the working group and everything else. I have information that I'd like to get out. Now, you were very kind and courteous to Chief Ting and his time. I would appreciate if we all could get that kind of courtesy. It is eight o'clock now, and we still haven't even gone through half of what is on the agenda. I get what you're saying, Camille, but you do not run the agenda. I'm not running the agenda. Allegra what I'd like to do it is, and it is a three-minute limit. And if you limit. have to go, then you can go. Just it make us one of the calls. It is a three-minute limit. I'd like to get through and do my part of it, at least. Well, if you had to go, you should have let us know that right off the bat. And we I would want have made to the hear what people to have to say. To I want to hear what people have to say, but I don't want to sit for 20 minutes while someone tells their life story. And that's not talking this time. There were other things that were going on in the last meeting and they went on and on and on. And it would be really nice if people would keep to the three minute limit make a list of the things that they want to talk about and go through that instead of this being a session. These are not listening sessions where we're meeting in the community. I have met a lot of people in the community and it is great to hear voices, but I would like to hear everyone's voice. 
And well, that's what I'm, I'm sorry to I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this is not your meeting. Yet again, I have to remind you of that. You can remind this me. This is not. You this want, is not your okay? meeting. I'm sorry. And my but thing there is, is and a the three thing is, is that we do want to hear from the community. Again, we do want to hear three from the community. Minutes. Again, three no, minute no, limit. No, it's not any three minute. If they want yes, to speak it is. three minutes, they will. Yes, it is. Because this is my this is my meeting along it's, with Allegra. It is already in there. It was a three minute limit, and it was already. I read it. It was in the agenda. Okay. Anyway, we're going to move on. Yes. We're going Thank to move you. on, and then me and you are going to have a, a discussion off offline. On we this can have one any time you want. This is not going to happen want. again. Camille. We can Let have one any time you want. I am okay. open door, open book. I have always stated I am here for the community. Just Thank don't you. take over my don't take over my group because this is not this is not. Um, the case. Excuse me, but again. this is the CSSJC. It's a group for the people. It is for the people. And Thank you are you. taking over it. You're not letting the people talk. I'm not what I'm exactly. Hearing, what I'm you hearing is you talking. Member. You just silenced the I town member. I asked them. I said the time is up. That is a big difference. Thank you. Anyway, let me say this right now. If someone wants to go on beyond three minutes, please do. Okay. If there's any other hands up, please speak. I don't see any other hands up as of right now. There will be an additional public comment period at the end. That you can speak beyond three minutes. Why uh, don't we hear from Camille about the updates and see what else happens. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see this? Not yet. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion updates for July 2024. The Youth Empowerment, Crescent DEI will be Sharon and AmeriCorps member who will be working with both departments on youth engagement and youth empowerment. The AmeriCorps member will begin her 10 month fellowship in late August. DEI updates. The Resident Oversight Board, the Community Engagement Report has been provided to the town manager. The Technical Assistance RFP was publicized. The town manager has not finalized the selection process. Philip Avila, the new Assistant DEI Director to begin on August 5th, 2024. Um, becoming beloved community event on allyship led by Jana McClure will take place on July 25th, 2024 at the Banks Community Center from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Light freshments will be provided. And now on to our Crest updates for July, 2024. As you've noticed in the call volume, they have gone down, um, decreased in June, they can be attributed to the shift in population in town as school has ended. The department was shuttered for a two-day training and two staff attended two-day CIT training and staff vacations. The Racial Equity Institute. So it was a foundational two-day training in historical and institutional racism workshop philosophy and focus that is designed to develop the capacity of participants to understand racism in its institutional and structural form. Moving the focus from individual bigotry and bias, the Racial Equity Institute's phase one workshop presents a historical, cultural, structural, and institutional analysis of racism. The REI, the Racial Equity Institute, is committed to bringing awareness and analysis to the root causes of disparities and dispropor disproportionality in order to create a racially equitable organizations and systems. Even 50 years after significant civil rights gains, the impact of race continues to shape the outcome of all organizations towards institution, and wait, excuse me, institutions, and is harmful to everyone. Our approach has a movement orientation, always focused on people. 
We recognize many intersectional oppressions, but what we have learned is that racism is the glue that connects all oppressions and thus our focus on race and injustices that stem from history and belief systems that are reflected in American culture and institutions. We had participants from various town departments, including the Crest Department, DEI, APD, AFD, Public Health Department, Information and Technology, Planning, and the school. Another thing that was worked on, we have, this is our Emergency Communication Center SOPs for CRESS. So this was worked on in conjunction with the GPL, which is the Government Performance Lab. One of the things that we're working on is triaging the calls and how the um, dispatch will be dispatching CRESS calls from now on. So right now, this is in um, still being worked on with the dispatch center and also with Chief Ting as he did speak on this. Amherst Independence Day. We had the wonderful celebration where we tabled, assisted with citizen transport, supported citizen well being, which is we assisted with ambulatory needs, and I served as the MC at the event. It was a wonderful time and people really enjoyed themselves. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about is how we are also going to Puffer's Pond, um, Groff Park, Mill River, et cetera, as there have been discussions with um, APD. And there have been a lot of calls that have gone through to APD that we are now taking of people at Puffer's Pond, which is conservation land, um, drinking and loud music. And also there's no unleashed dogs there. So instead of having an APD presence, what has happened now is that we have been getting calls directly and we go um, in place of APD. Also, we are having our pamphlets translated into Spanish, hopefully with the help of Amherst College. They have a session in the fall. I've been working collaboratively with them to get one of their senior students to come and do the translation for us. As we uh, last year, I guess while I wasn't here, had some of our other information translated into Spanish. Um, also, one of the things that was talked about was the youth empowerment. Um, I got this information today. The town finance department is managing the grant with the input and support of Amherst Recreation and the town manager's office. So youth empowerment is now in the hands of the town finance department. Thank you. So I have some questions. Sure. So Camille, um, is, uh, what is it, Pamela, is she going to be joining our meetings in the future or is, is this how we're going to be getting the information moving forward? Well, right now she was busy with a class uh, yesterday and the day before. So um, today is when she gave me the information. So she yeah, will so, be joining. She will be so joining. So she will be joining. Okay, so she will be joining because obviously even though you know the report highlighted some some aspects of the information, um, it, you know it doesn't give a lot of details, and you know I have questions in terms of the the DEI um, youth empowerment. I know you've you've mentioned certain things that are occurring. Um, but, however, I have a lot more detailed um, questions to ask, and I don't think you you'd have the answers, right? Not on that one, but I will tell you this, the youth empowerment is not in the hands of DEI. That's why I just read the statement there. Um, it's in the town finance department is managing the grant and it is with the support of recreation and the yeah. town manager's office. Okay, so so I guess, so that's 
but I'll have to ask that question to Pamela though, because youth empowerment was always under the DEI. I mean, that was it's, one of the things that was um, stated within the recommendations of CSWG that and, was adopted by the town council was that DEI would be overseeing the establishment of youth empowerment. So now you're telling me that youth empowerment has totally moved right. into this other area of finance and recreation. Yes. And so who are these people, you know, that, and this is what I'm trying to explain is that um, it never was in DEI, okay? It went to Recre Park uh, Rec, it went to the Recreation Department, and now the Town Finance Department is managing the grant. So it never was in DEI. Well, I, I'll, I mean, I'll you, to you, differ. You, you I'll said, to uh, differ with you because remember, I've been here since CSSGC started. Yes, but when it I'm, was in DEI and originally, it did it, start with DEI. Yes, it, it is. The grant, the grant may have originally been done to go to DEI, but the grant was given to REC. And that's I this is what I was asking about it because I was questioning where the grant money was. And this is what I, I emailed a few people today. And that's how I found out that the grant was not in DEI. It never was in DEI. It may have been suggested by the CSW, um, by the working group that it go to DEI, but it never did go to DEI. It was always in REC. It was given to REC. And right now the finance department is the ones that's managing it. Also, um, Last month, there were, I'm like, I'm looking at my calendar. There were three events. I mean, that's right. That's right. Because um, there was, excuse me, I'm just looking at my calendar. Juneteenth, the basketball and race amenity day. So those were the three biggest events of the year that happened that DEI put on. So, mm -hmm. um, all right. So I guess I'll, I'll follow up with Pamela and the town manager to ask them more questions about this, because like I said, that this is new information. I've been on in this group for two years and Pamela has responded in regards to youth empowerment. And actually when there was the last AmeriCorps member that worked with DEI and CRESS, his duties was to actually do a survey for the youth and do uh, some programming in the meantime, while the youth empowerment center was not put in place. So again, this is, I, I get it. I, that, I did. You know, yes, I did. Oh, so one of the things that I do know is that um, the previous uh, AmeriCorps member that that was something that they were supposed to be doing and that did not happen. So um, I actually went to the AmeriCorps training um, for when we get the AmeriCorps person and their main focus is going to be on the youth. Okay. But that is, they're going to work between CRESS and DEI on youth programming, but that is not part of the youth empowerment. And um, and I remember from the very first when uh, three months ago when I started the first meeting that I went to two days after I started that that was talked about the youth empowerment. There is that it wasn't part of DAI then. So that part I do remember. Um, okay. So um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll focus my um, questions more so on Crest. Okay. So it, are you able to put that those um, um, stats back up, the data, in terms of the calls and everything that you all receive? Sure. Let me see if I can. I think I closed them out. Excuse me one moment. Okay, let me do a screen share. Okay, can you see them? Mm -hmm. Yep, I can see them. So, um, just so I, well, I wanted to have a little bit more time because I know that it kind of went quickly. So I'm not sure that the rest of CSSJC really got a chance to kind of look at these numbers. So I just wanted to make sure that people had a little bit of, of time to. 
No problem. I can also send this to people that want it. If anybody wants this, that's actually why I wanted it done in this manner so that not only could you see it, that also um, I can, let's see. Oh. Yeah, if you can share, um, if you could share the, uh, the, the data with CSSJC, that would be great. Sure. Wait a minute, let me put this back up. I don't know why. Sorry. There we go. Um, and then for me, I, I guess what would be helpful, you know, some of these are self-explanatory, but I, you know, just so that the community can know, you mm -hmm. know, what it is, what if you could just kind of go through, okay, so it's the call source, May, June. And then CAD types, whatever, what, what, what okay. does CAD mean, so, you know, those sort of things. Sure, not a problem. All right, so the call source is where the calls came from. So a town department, um, office walk-ins, previous engagements could be that we've met somebody out in the community or we've had talked to them at a town department or we have done something with them. Um, Phone calls is self-explanatory. Social service agencies are when other agencies, our partners or collaborative people call us. Um, dispatch are calls that we've gotten from dispatch, email and business calls. So CAD stands for, oh my goodness, computer aided dispatch. Okay, so those are the ones, those are the, how we uh, quantify our calls for data. Um, so, and this is, if you look down, you'll see assist a business or agency, assist a citizen, follow up, a well-being check, community engagement, assist APD, citizens transport, and community outreach, which was formerly called the Crest Presence Walk Drive, which I changed because I felt presence was too um, geared more towards police and not community. Um, it was not... I didn't feel it represented our work doing, doing, being in the community. So one of the things also I wanted to mention about dispatch, when people call dispatch, 911 is actually a call type because all calls that go into APD, unless they know a specific number, all go through dispatch. So when people call dispatch, they're actually calling the business line. But most of our calls, because we have been out in the community and I've made it you know, my mission to be out in the community so that people can see us. Um, for example, today we did the Amherst Survival Center cookout and while we were there, we were able to talk to some folks that were having some difficulty. And we've already set up meetings to help them navigate some of the things that are happening in their lives. So the main thing for us is to be out in the public, to engage with the community, to meet them in areas where they are, like in Puffer's Pond, to meet them at Mill Valley Estates, Butternut, or Colonial Village. Um, that is my goal is to be out and that people don't need to call the police department uh, again because most people who are part of this community now know just to call us directly so um, yeah go ahead um, so if say the survival center calls you and there's somebody that they need assistance with, does that fall under assist citizen or assist business agency? Um, I think that is, that is assist business agency. But one of the things also is that we do community outreach, which is the part of it is outreach is that we go to the Emmer Survival Center um, just to check in on things when they're having events or when they're doing uh, their food or their lunches. So we're out there meeting the people that are in the community. 
So another example is if they call about a concerned citizen, it's a cis citizen. Um, if it's to de-escalate at the Amherst Survival Center, then it's an assist business. And oftentimes this also um, results in a follow-up. So, um, so you're saying, I mean, I, I get what you're saying in terms of being out in the community and outreaching, which obviously is is a great thing and, and it, it's a big part of it. However, you know, having that option to call into the police, because a lot of people know 911, you know what I'm saying? That's something that's been kind of like, it, it you know, hammered into your head and it's, uh, you know, three, three numbers and people know that. So the thing though, too, that we always wanted to, to have is, is that opportunity that if they do call 911, because, you know, they're in crisis, that's an easy number to remember or anything like that, that, you know, if it's appropriate for Crest to respond, that dispatch will, will send out Crest. So, I mean, right now, I mean, we're seeing, you know, dispatch like zero for June, you know what I'm saying? So, and in May, there was two uh, dispatch. Um, so, you know, what, what it, so are you saying that you're, you're doing so much that then dispatch is going to be, there's nothing going to be dispatched. I mean, I, I just don't see that ever being a reality. So what is happening now is that I'm meeting with the supervisor of dispatch weekly. And what is happening is we're going over the call logs for the previous week. Um, he was on vacation. So we went over the past two weeks. And what we've done is we've been going over all the calls to look to see what could be a crest call. The problem is, is that due to HIPAA and regulations and laws, I can only see a portion of the call. So I can see an address and I can see the call type. And as Chief Ting mentioned, what is called in for a call doesn't necessarily mean that is what the actual call is about. So because I can't see what the actual call is at this time, um, I'm waiting on to get some additional training to find out if that's even possible. Then once that happens, then I would be able to see what the actual call is and be able to see what the result was. And this way, working with dispatch and also with the um, operating procedures that we're working on now, as Chief Ting spoke about, being able to go to more of the calls to take some of the burden off the police and also to assist the community. So in other words, right now what's happening is people are calling us directly. If they call to dispatch for certain calls, then they will call us and that's where we go to. So it's not necessarily that we're dispatched to them. If something comes through, they might just put it right through to us but most of our calls are people calling us directly due to the fact that we've been out in the community and they are getting to know us. But to back to you, uh, Deborah, what you were talking about, those are the things that are in the works that since I've been here, that I've been adamant about getting more information and learning from dispatch exactly how we can work together to get these other calls that, don't necessarily need to go to APD, funnel to us. Camille, have you done community outreach in South Amherst? Yes. So, you have? yes. So, um, I'm looking at some of the places of where, I don't have the listing now. Um, one of the other things that's happening is, is that there is the, I can't read it from here, the Amherst Mobile Market. So the Amherst Mobile Market goes to uh, Saturday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursday. They go to four different areas each week. And Crest has been going now to do outreach with them to talk to the community. Also, there's a couple of community members that I'm working directly with um, for Butternut and Colonial Village. 
So people are reaching out to me to work together so that we can find better ways to deal with the citizens, our neighbors, rather than calling the police. Do we have any other questions for Camille in terms of Cress or anything else that she shared? Do you still need this up? No, if you could just um like like I was saying, you know, if you could just share it with um C with us at CSSAC, that would be great. Sure, um, I can send this then, out tomorrow. Yeah, because then if we have any other follow up questions, um, and then you know maybe if we can get these, if if this is something that you could do, you know, on a monthly basis, if we can get them maybe a few days before the the meeting, then we can you know digest it a little bit more and then have the information to be able to kind of ask any kind of informed questions. That's not a problem. So one of the things that I'm trying to do, like I said, is work um, trying to get with the supervisor of dispatch weekly to get these calls. And like I said, because I can't see the exact nature of the call, I can see how it comes in. Like it may say that it came in as a well-being check. Okay. But because I can't see the narrative part of it, um, then that doesn't allow me to effectively work with uh, dispatch to get the call rerouted to Crest. So those are the type of things that are being worked on and working with um, APD and dispatch to get these done. So it takes time. It's frustrating because um, as Chief Ting said, one of the things is about how uh, the liability aspect of it, the safety and the liability. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you know, that we are a standalone department and want to stay that way. But at the same time, also, you know, making sure that I'm keeping my people safe too. So as a firefighter, retired firefighter, I know that things can change on a dime. So getting the most information that we can will help make this much easier and enable us to work better together. I think if we don't have any other questions, we can move forward to the next agenda item. listening sessions so. yeah for, for the town hall because i know we already had selected um a few dates on for i think it was what late september yeah so we had selected the 14th of september and the 21st of september two saturdays so it's just about us kind of trying to figure out like, I think if we're going to do two Saturdays, maybe try to do one in kind of like, you know, earlier morning, like maybe not super early, but maybe let's say like 10 o'clock or something. And then the other one do it later, like after five, so that we get, you know, maybe a second shift or something like that, you know? Yeah. No, that makes sense. Because we know that there's a lot of people that work on Saturdays, so I want to be mindful of that. Um and then what we need to do between now and then is really kind of focusing on where are the locations we need to make like the connections with people in the community to see um you know because this time is going to be different we're going to be going into the community into the different let's say apartment com complexes and things like that but we want to be invited you know we want to make sure that people are welcoming us in as opposed to us just showing up you know and I do believe that Lauren Mills had 
offered to maybe help with if butternut might be an option for one of okay, us. Okay, so, so Lauren can help out with butternut. Yeah, I'll I'll follow up with her. Okay. Um. I will just say this. Um, I spoke to Lauren Mills today. She is very active um, in her community. And also she is very eager to get Cress in and has actually invited us to come table and talk to the residents. Mm -hmm. So that will be coming up. I don't know if it's later this week or next week. Great. Um, and so I think having having a complex would be good. I, I'm just thinking of which other places have community rooms. Like I know Olympia Oaks has like a community room, um, but I. Yeah, I have another community member contact in Village Park, so oh. I can I can follow up with her there. Because uh, it also might be nice to have like one on each end of town kind of. Yeah. Um, Village Park would be great. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll contact my... Uh contact out there to see maybe if we can um is there anyone else on the committee that has any other um contacts with other folks um you know there's mill valley there's um you know like south point but i guess it's not called south point anymore <laughs> what is it called now i, I don't know <laughs> i, I can't refer to it as renew. south point renew huh? i think it's renew Okay. Yeah. I still just call it South Point. I'm never not going to, but <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I can try to get in contact with the property manager for the boulders and renew. Cause I believe that they're now owned by the same um, real realtor company. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you could, but they but don't have community rooms. Yeah. As far as I know. You said they don't have, they don't have no, a lot of the events that they have are outdoors. Okay. Yeah, but maybe we could just we could just go outdoors, you know. Yeah, I mean, they have events outdoors. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, because the thing that we want to do is obviously have you know the translators there. Um, see if there's funding to bring some food and something to drink and things like that, so that we make it more of a, you know, kind of you know almost a a, a festive, more informal conversation, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to you know, a formal town forum or something like that. So, you know, have food and something to drink there. Translators. Okay, Boulders. And what was the other uh, place that you said? It was Boulders and which other one was that? I think it's Renew. Oh yeah, Renew, which was the formerly South Point. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right, awesome. So, all right, so I think we have three options with Allegra, you going to Butternut, me contacting my contact in Village Park, and then um, Lisette with uh, Boulders and Renew. And then we can, um, when we meet in August, we can um, touch base and see how things are going because by that point, we should probably have an idea in terms of you know, times, what times we want to actually do it. And then, um, you know, kind of work out some of the details so we can put a flyer together and start, you know, setting out the promotions around it. Sounds good. Um, is this just for our board or is Cress going to be coming as well? Um, I think that's more so up to you, Camille, if you want to also um be there have some crest members there to interact with the community when we have the town forums well we could check into the schedule i don't see why not definitely mm -hmm. during the daytime one um and depending mm -hmm. what time it is saturday yeah okay sure because i think yeah the more opportunities that the community has to connect with crest i think it's always a good thing so, because they would be these listening, these town forums that we do is more like listening sessions um, mm -hmm. for the community. We do just kind of like a quick little, you know, presentation, very brief in terms of things that we're doing. And they pretty much open it up to questions and answers um, for the community because it's their time, you know, with us. Anything else we want to talk about that in terms of the... Um, but just to kind of put it out there for anyone that's going to also listen to the recording that the dates that we're looking at again is 
September 14th and September 21st. So that folks can at least save the date. Legro, what's next on our agenda? Next is any other topics we didn't reasonably anticipate 48 hours in advance, and I don't have anything, so. Mm -hmm. I think we're obligated to have... Uh, Everald, you're breaking up a little bit. Yeah, you're breaking up. An administrative meeting. So what is it? I, I'm suggesting that... Um, can you, is this better? Yes. Or, or to have yeah, it's better. An administrative meeting. So I would, I'm suggesting that we do it. I'm suggesting that we do it the next meeting, given that it's a new year for the committee. And, um, I would also like to, um, try to invite the people that are behind the, affordable housing project that's being built in Amherst to one of our meetings to come and talk about how and what um, credit counseling is available out there now and what people can do in anticipation because um, those houses were already approved. And so now it's just a matter of people doing what they need to do to get qualified for one of these. So um, with the board's permission, I'd like to try and invite um, the people that are behind this to see if someone will come and talk um in our meeting that would be great um i can go back because i know the housing trust had a little um presentation from them recently and they named the person who's like doing a lot of the outreach so i can see if i can find her name um i appreciate I that yeah. that'd be good to have um and um, Avril, unfortunately, I missed the, I don't know if other people heard, but I missed the first part that you said it's, it's a new year and you wanted to do something. I couldn't, I couldn't catch everything. Oh, I think we're obligated to have just a board meeting um, because it's a new term. Um, so I was, I was suggesting, I think at the start of the new term, so I was suggesting that the next meeting be that meeting and we can just talk about um items, goals for the year, and things like that. Um, okay, like do more of a kind of like, since like um, you're saying in August, that would be, that would count as like uh, the start of our new year for the, for, for our committee, yeah. and then to kind of do like what would be our goals for the year, things like that? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I think what we could do, you know, even though we can't reply all, but you all can maybe get um, you know, we can kind of send out an email to to the to the group, and then you all can kind of just reply to like each person could reply to Allegra and I to say, okay, these are some of the things that I think you know the goals should be and things like that, and then we can kind of discuss further because I know we're all going to have like different things that we'd want to kind of focus on for the year, and then we can kind of um, you know discuss those and and see what we want to focus on for this next. Um, committee year. Okay, makes sense. That sounds good. Um, the other thing too that you know, once I do get more information around who the um the you know who's in charge of the youth empowerment, um, we'd probably want to get invite them to to meet with us too, um, because you know again, this is all really kind of startling and new information to me that the Youth empowerment is now under, you know, rec and, and finance, or it's always been, which again, news to me, because I haven't heard that that um, statement before. So I want to invite them because we need to ask them more questions in regards to that. So yeah, maybe, maybe we could have like a calendar of, you know, the meetings for the next year and plug in some yes. people we might want to invite yeah. from the community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I, I think that's my, um, the idea is for the next meeting, it's, it's not 
um, or standard meeting, but we set an agenda, um, things we want to discuss, people we want to invite, um, and understandably the agenda can the agenda may change um, over the course of the year, but we seriously think about um, committee goals, people to invite, um, and work towards like some of those goals, yeah. Sounds good. All right. Shall we move on to the second public comment period? Well, as long as we're clear that they can go beyond three minutes. Okay, this is Pat Nanibaku again from Tamarack Drive. Before I do my second public comment, uh, may I ask how many people were raising their hand during the first public comment before I got interrupted? And this question goes to Deborah. How many people in the audience raised their hand for the first well, public it the, comment? It was only Vera and you, Miss Pat. There, there you go. Yeah. So um I think Camille um and I'm just, you know, hmm. So what I wanted to say is that I think you need more time to understand what this particular body is all about. It's unlike any other town committee. Is very different. This is the only body that marginalized folks can come to speak. And also, I think you need to reflect on what your role is at CSSJC. I am one of the inaugural and founding member of CSWG, myself and Councillor Alicia Walker, with the support of the rest of the committee. And you don't want people to be bringing up history, but I'll continue to do that because as somebody like you who is new, you need to, to know the history. We want CSSJC not to be like any other committee in our town with white supremacy, um, uh, white supremacy, um, you know, Oops. running the meeting like yeah. that. And so the three minutes for public comment is just made up. Who came up with the three minutes? CS CSSJC, right from last year, I was a member, I served one term, I decided not to continue. I can still make impact wherever I am because people do listen to what I say, even if you don't want to. And the three minutes doesn't apply to CSSJC. And I said that because I was part of CSWG that came up with this uh, committee. We want people to come and speak their mind and not to be silenced or be rushed or dismissed or disrespected. You did not give your fellow black woman the courtesy. She was running the meeting. And I mean, Deborah, and not you. Would the town manager do the same thing to the town president? Of course, no. And I just want to leave it there. You've left a very negative impression with your behavior tonight. And I want to point that out to you. You think you're trying to shut me up? It's never going to happen. I've lived in this town for 40 years and I'm not going anywhere. You better get used to me. You better get used to me. And I'll continue to speak out 
until the wrong is right. History will have to be repeated all over again until there is accountability. The Black Business Association did not get any APA funding. This is the forum because my group belonged to marginalized group. This is the forum that will listen to us, will work as a body to advocate for my group. We have MS Community Connections that does great work run by Chinese, by Asian American women. They didn't get funding either. We have MS Media run by Vera who spoke, but she is the chair board, the, 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 the board president. Did not get any funding. And then you don't want us to come here and speak up. We will continue to do that. We're not going anywhere. And I'll stop here. Thank you all for your time. Thank and you, I'm Ms. sorry, Deborah, that you were disrespected like this. Kamele, you need to apologize to Deborah. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Appreciate it. Yeah. Any other, um, anyone else want to make a public comment? So I, I do want to say, um, you know, because we have seven participants and I do want to make that message that, you know, um, I don't want people from the community to feel like they can't come to CSSJC and speak. Um, this is a safe place. Uh, you will not be silenced. I know that, you know, obviously when you're told that there's only a certain time limit, then you, you might think that um, you can't speak up but we're here to listen to you. Anything that you wanna bring up in terms of the town, social justice, marginalization, underrepresentation, um, and dealing with you know, a variety of different things as, as, as you know, Ms. Pat stated, like in terms of opera, school committee, whatever the case may be, we're here to listen to you all. And so I just wanna reassert that and reaffirm that because it's very important that we hear from you. We hear from the community. And this is always a place that you can come and, and talk to us. Allegra, is there anything else or? I don't think so. I'm not seeing any other hands. So we can adjourn. At eight forty-four. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Oh, we just got to talk about oh, our next meeting. meeting. Oh, right. yeah, our next meeting. <laughs> Let's see. It will um, be August fourteenth. And and that is our administrative meeting. Yes. Okay. We'll just have to kind of Everald. I know. I think you have more of an idea of, of you know, the focus and and things like that. Maybe um you can um send some ideas to to Allegra and I, uh, and then we can kind of start working on it. And and then like I said, others should send us um what it is that you all want to focus on. But Everald, you might give us more kind of what what is your focus? You know. Because okay. we want to get the most out of it. Yeah, because um, <laughs> yeah, it's typically not a meeting that's um, where we have other agenda items. Mm -hmm. It's literally um, to talk about direction, um, ground rules, meeting procedures, and then put together um, a calendar of meetings and what we hope to achieve and try to plan um meetings without having to do them like after each meeting um each time we meet. yeah
So yes, I will I will work on something and send um to the group well before um August 14. Okay. That's good. Okay. Right. Right, everyone. Um have a Maybe good night. Turn. See you all soon. Have a good night. Good night.